Well, sure. Okay. What was I aiming for? I was aiming for something that I hadn't seen before. I do know that I did have to rape one of my good friends in the back of a Volvo when I was 17 and still a virgin and very confused about what we were supposed to be doing. I can guarantee you my parents will not go see this movie. Um, well, it's just a lot of fun. Like, there's, for me, <laughs> I mean, well honestly, said. what could be more fun than masturbation, really? <laughs> well said, Emily. What indeed? As far as the other unhinged quotes, that I pulled for that intro. We'll get into all of that later. But first, let me introduce myself. I am the spawn of Satan. I'm his favorite daughter. Here to talk about horror movies with you all. And since I am in the business of cult worship, you are welcome to join mine. All you have to do is click subscribe. Easy as that. But I also recommend clicking the like button and the notification bell. That way you never miss our next meeting. In today's meeting, we're discussing the greatest werewolf movie ever made. Yep, yep, I said it. I told you last week in my deep dive of an American werewolf in London that we would have that debate today. Ginger Snaps is the greatest werewolf movie of all time, and I'm gonna uncover every single reason why today. Starting with scripting development, finding funding and casting. Then we'll talk about all the stunt work involved in this film, as well as some of the makeup and of course the effects. After production, the next subject is theme. There is a lot to break down about this movie, a lot of very relatable stuff. Then of course, we'll talk release, reception, sequels, and legacy, because there is a reason why we're talking about this 24 years later. So if all of that sounds good to you, then sit back, grab a drink, grab a snack, let's get into this deep dive. Let's start with scripting development. This journey started with director John Fawcett and writer Karen Walton being born, essentially. I always like to include a bit of info about the people that made the movie because you can see just how much their life influenced the art. John Fawcett was born in 1968 in Edmonton, Canada, making him probably 31 at the time of production. He grew up in the exact high school setting that we see in this film, and he was always attracted to the goth girls in the goth cliques. In his words, he liked the girls with dark eyeliner and black clothing. Unfortunately for him, they never liked him back because apparently he was too straight-laced. This gave him inspiration for the characters that he wanted to portray in Ginger Snaps, but not to an exact degree. The girls in Ginger Snaps couldn't be clearly defined, they couldn't be specifically goth or seem to fit in any type of clique, but rather be true outsiders. These characters didn't just come to him in a dream though, they first started out more like caricatures. He described it as them sort of being like Tim Burton drawings. And then screenwriter Karen Walton fleshed them out. Before she agreed to the project, her initial reaction was actually to say no way. She wasn't a fan of the horror genre and its general portrayal of women, but she does admit that she was ignorant to what the genre had to offer. So she was tasked with writing a horror film that she would actually go out and see herself. And lo and behold, this was the first of her screenplays to ever actually be adapted into a film. I think it turned out so well because she related so directly to the characters that she was writing particularly Bridget. She hated the suburbs, the homogeneity, that she lived in a world where atrocities were normal, but nothing mattered to people unless it was happening to them. She said that being a teen living somewhere like that made you want to do something crazy just to shake things up, which is why so many teenage girls feel insane. Both John and Karen in their commentaries said that they got the most inspiration from directors like David Cronenberg, particularly from The Fly. Other inspirations they listed off would be Dead Ringers, Heathers, even Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Karen also cited a book called Promiscuities by Naomi Wolf, which now I really want to read. But of course, you already know that An American Werewolf in London was the blueprint, sort of. The only really half-decent werewolf movie was American Werewolf in London, as far as I was concerned. The thing I liked about that was the sense of humor that it had. It had a good sense of humor, and I enjoyed that. Um, but really, when I was looking at this, I was kind of going, werewolf movies are cheesy. I really disliked the mythological, magical aspects of the werewolf. So I wanted to bring kind of science and biology to it. So it wasn't going to be like uh, the, the, the moon pops out and then you run around and kill a bunch of shit and then turn back to normal. It was going to be a very slow, steady transformation that there was no return from. So this was shaping up to be a werewolf movie that no one had seen before. Later on, I'll get into a more complete list of changes from script to screen, because there were quite a few of them. But once the script was written, like many classic movies, getting funding was a chore and a half. With An American Werewolf in London, it was because studios did not understand the tone of the film. With this one, it was something a lot more serious. They were shopping around with the script in 1999, and if you're an American, or I guess all 
also if you're a Canadian, then you might remember that is the year of one of the most deadly school shootings in our country's history. Columbine definitely shaped the culture at the time. Also, feel free to check out my Scream 3 deep dive. We get into it there as well. It actually completely changed the Scream 3 script, but luckily it did not change Ginger Snaps. It just meant that a lot of the studios turned it away because regardless of the actual content of the script, a lot of them couldn't get past the whole concept of kids killing other kids. The casting community of Toronto and all their wisdom had decided decided to boycott this movie. But they deemed that it was uh, kids killing kids, which is uh, uh, outrageous to me. Considering this absolute crap that gets made, that they could say that, uh, or even like, you know, you just kind of go, Meh, you're not smart enough to make that decision for, for us. It became such a thing that it became an article in the Globe and Mail, and it, it caused us endless uh, problems getting the movie made. Ginger Snaps was then shot in only 30 days for $5 million, and John Fawcett had to use a lot of his own money. He did not make anything by producing this film. Unbelievable that he wouldn't see any rewards for his labor until much later, but we'll get into that in a bit. As soon as the script and money were at their disposal, they had to find the perfect girls to fit these really eccentric roles. They searched in Toronto, Montreal, LA, and New New York, and they finally found both Katie and Emily in Montreal. John Fawcett says that he, quote, discovered Emily in Montreal, and I'm like, she was in it. I, like, let's, please. Katie and Emily had actually grown up together, and they even had the same agent, which might be why their chemistry was so good. Emily was indeed 22 playing a 14-year-old, but she resonated really deeply with the script. Well, I was a women's studies student at UBC at the time, and so I really liked the coming of age from a female perspective because I hadn't seen a lot of films that were about adolescence and sexuality from a girl's point of view. Mm. And I love the bond between the sisters, but I love how it uses fantasy to sort of tell a truth that would be hard to tell with just, you know, telling a, a more conventional sort of coming-of-age story right. to portray a psychological truth. But unfortunately for John, when he found her, she had the perfect look, but then came time for rehearsals and she had chopped all her hair off. In the audio commentary, he said that her hair and the wig situation were the bane of his existence for a while. And my thing is like, why did she have to wear a wig? It looked bad. Why did it matter whether or not she had long hair? They're a subversive pair, like just let her have short hair. But then I saw some of the rehearsal footage and I'll play it here. Just get her out of the freezer, okay? Oh wait, that's the, uh, don't you dig in and go shit? Yeah. You, like you try and get her out and then she's, oh, let's go again. And I was like, oh, okay, I, I see. I like that her hair acts as a protective curtain to the world. She's a character that starts out very wrapped up and guarded. She doesn't even like making eye contact with people when she talks to them. So now I do see why the wig was necessary now that I know her character a bit better, but I wish they shelled out for a better one because it's usually kind of distracting to me. Catherine Isabel, who they all refer to as Katie, was actually only 17 at the time of filming. So she was four and a half years younger than Emily Perkins. I was worried about horror stories she might have had on set because any time that you have really young women or uh, children involved on set, I'm like, please, dear God, tell me that nothing creepy happened to them. And it seems like things were mostly good. Mostly. I do know that I did have to rip one of my good friends in the back of a Volvo when I was 17 and still a virgin and very confused about what we were supposed to be doing. And I asked our driver, I was like, I didn't I didn't drink um, alcohol at the time, but I was like, I need a little, I need a little something. I got me a little, like something really easy. Like, like a little glass of rosé or something to just loosen me up so I can go rape this friend of mine in the back of a Volvo as I morph into a werewolf. And he comes back with a Mickey of hot cinnamon fireball whiskey and I'm just sitting like alone in my trailer like trying to sip like the most like painful drink and be like, I can do this. I'm gonna rape Jesse. I got this. <laughs> to this day, I still give him shit about that. It's pretty funny. John talks about this moment in the commentary like, oh yeah, Katie had fun. We were all having fun. But she was talking about it in that interview like she was so nervous. And I'm like, who was supervising this? Who go, who gave her alcohol? The legal drinking age is 19 in most parts of Canada. I think it's 18 in like a few different territories or something. If you feel so uncomfortable in a work situation that you need to be intoxicated, please listen to your body. It seems like Catherine was in the best case scenario here because she just seemed to be uncomfortable because she had no real life experience with sex. But if you're uncomfortable and the environment is not seeming safe, then say no. Leave. People pleasing is not worth risking your safety for. I wish someone told me that when I was 19 and working as a PA for the 
first time on a film set, so I don't know who needed to hear that, but there you have it. Like I said, for the most part, their experience seemed really positive, and I'm pretty jealous of this next bit. I really enjoyed working with um, some of the male actors as well, partly because, like, the guys typically on a set are sort of the main characters. And in this case, you you could feel like male actors, especially at that age, they kind of have an ego, right? You sort of felt like this hesitation, like what's going on here? It's not about us, it's about these like two girls. They were kind of subdued. And whereas normally I could tell they were the kind of people who would be like really out there and like talking nonstop. But when they would be around Katie and I, they were kind of like, hmm, like they wouldn't say too much. And they really sort of sensed that we were the ones that were, that had the power in this situation. So that was really fun. Do you see how women learn from such a young age that they are not the main characters in this world, that this was actually a novel experience? We have to learn the pecking order when we're children. It's sick, it's sick and twisted. I'll tell you what was sick and not twisted though, some of the stunt work that it took to accomplish this movie. What a transition that was, huh? This movie had stunts going on in places that you wouldn't even really expect, including in the first attack scene where Ginger gets bitten. I thought that this was just puppetry. Here they had a stunt person suspended in the air by a rig on her back, and she was cabled from her hips and shoulders so that she could quickly get dropped up and down and go back and forth, and the werewolf head was attached to her body. It was also attached to the stunt woman who was standing in for Catherine, so the rigged person had to go wherever she wanted. Went. A horrifying fun fact about this scene was brought to light in Karen Walton's commentary. She said this scene was supposed to feel like sexual assault because sexual violence is a part of every woman's life. Sad but true is all I can say. Another horror story about stunts from this set is the day that they were shooting this field hockey fight scene. Danielle Hampton has very specific texture in her hair, so the stunt woman wore a wig, par for the course. But the wig was not the right length or density, so it was being trimmed after it was applied, and the hairdresser cut her ear because they were in a big rush. She came to set still bleeding, and after take after take, she eventually was hit right in the nose by Catherine Isabel. John Fawcett also said that he thinks someone stole her wallet from her trailer that day too. Like, she could not catch a break. This next scene involved the same character, but it was a different stunt woman. Her name was Kim, and she had done all the harness stuff for Ginger's attack scene earlier in the movie. But remember when Trina hits her head? So they put a foam cover on the countertop, but even so, it would still hurt to bash your head on it. Luckily, they only asked the stunt woman to do one take and then they sent her home. But following that scene is another nightmare. Danielle had some stunt woman taking a beating for her in the previous scenes, but when her character was stuffed in the freezer, that was actually the actress herself covered in makeup. I thought it was a fake body. She did such a great job staying still and looking dead despite the discomfort she was in. This poor girl was claustrophobic, just smothered in this makeup, and she had to lay perfectly still stuffed in this box with her eyes open while having these horrible contacts in. The makeup was utterly fantastic in this movie. I also especially love when Ginger kills her teacher. He looks great, but YouTube doesn't like when I show stuff like that. I can still talk about it though, and I will. So let's get into some of the effects and round off all the stunt talk with one of the best scenes of the movie. Oh, goddamn force of nature. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just a quick fun fact that the man who played the janitor in this scene did all of his own stunts and barely spoke a lick of English. What a trooper. Also, when Ginger punches into the poor guy's stomach, she was really punching into a bloody cup that was full of soggy, ripped up toilet paper. Such a simple effect, yet so effective. These action-heavy sequences were also Emily Perkins' favorite to shoot. I actually love doing action sequences and um, really getting to be physical because I think as an actress that's really my weakness is that I'm very almost cerebral in my approach to character development. Like I, I think about the psychology of the character but I don't necessarily think too much about the physical presence of the character which is really a flaw. And so when I'm doing action sequences it sort of forces me to become physical. Their best scenes are when this is all combined though, in my opinion, especially the ending when Ginger is fully transformed. There's a very brief video you can watch here on YouTube where the effects team shows off how the wolf was made. You can see the early stages of sculpting and you can also see them capturing the wolf on a black screen in a studio, I think probably for a camera test. Along with the wolf effects, I learned something that I feel like I shouldn't have. Remember when Bridget finds the tail on Ginger's back? I mean, who could forget? So Catherine Isabel at the age of 17 was having a butt cast done by the special effects team. Like, what? We went over what casting is last week in my deep dive of an American werewolf in London. So she was booty out on a table getting smothered in plaster, I guess? 
Speaking of nudity, according to Karen Walton, the original design of the werewolf was going to have genitalia, but when that was lost, Fawcett made sure that they were still gonna go the whole tail route. He was really obsessed, apparently, with the idea of Ginger having a tail. Let's talk about just a few other things that were lost from script to screen. There were a lot of them, but I'm just gonna stick to the most interesting ones. And since a lot of these will tie into the themes, both of these sections will be interwoven. I think we all know the general theme of the movie, pretty hard to miss but I really like how Emily Perkins explains it. It definitely has a, a feminist consciousness to it. And I mean, the character of Bridget, she's very, she's a marginal character and you're forced to sort of identify with her. So it has a subversive kind of tone to it because, you know, anytime you're, you have to identify with the marginal character, the monster, you have to be critical of the of mainstream values. So I think that's what makes it different. And it's, they're very strong female characters. And you know, really the films are about repressed female desire. And you know, the, the fact that that our society is so um, critical of female desire and it's really something that teenage girls are, are taught to be fearful of. So that's what it's about. It's about the horror of, you know, being a teenage girl. She gets to the real meat of it because on the surface level, yeah, it's it's about menstruation, becoming a woman. Also interesting tangent, the werewolf is associated with the lunar cycle, which you would think has like a direct correlation to the menstrual cycle, but Fawcett jokes that this is the first werewolf movie not to feature a full moon in a shot. They even decided to stray so far away from that as to not use blue lighting at nighttime, which is standard. They went for more of an orangey tone and kind of played off of the natural lighting of the suburbs, like street lamps and stuff. But anyway, back to, you know, the themes of the menstrual cycle and all of that. It's a deeply complex theme with so many different facets, many of which are obviously explored in this movie, including the differences between testosterone and estrogen as exemplified through Jesse going mad and Ginger getting hot. Becoming a woman is terrible, but getting hot is is awesome. You also have Bridget feeling left behind when she sees her sister developing. She starts to pursue sex. I think that pretty much every woman has been there because you're constantly seeing all the other women around you, whether or not you're in school or it's, you know, other women in your family. You're seeing them develop. You're feeling left behind. It's definitely a thing for preteen girls and teenage girls to want to be older than they are, to desire to reach a place in life where you actually have some autonomy. There are originally going to be even more themes crammed in and the existing ones were going to be hammed up even more. For example, the biology class that we see at the beginning of the film was originally going to be a sex education class, but they omitted that because they thought they were overdoing it. The initial attack was also originally supposed to take place as they were exiting a mall because Walton wanted to connect some of the themes to materialism as well. That would make sense to me because a lot of teen girls go through a klepto phase. I know I'm not alone in that. And it's partially driven by the insane beauty standards that are set on children. Ask almost almost any girl that had a stealing phase, what she was stealing, it was makeup, I promise you. This would have really rounded out the themes of repression in suburbia, but I understand why it was removed. In my head canon though, you better believe that Ginger was stealing those cigarettes she was smoking. Something they decided to lean into instead was presenting us with adult characters that these girls did not want to turn into. Obviously the mom is this really funny, upbeat woman and the girls think she's really cringe, but so is the school nurse who is so upbeat just teaching Ginger all about the horrors going on in her body. I love the contrast of this news delivery versus the subject matter of what she's actually talking about, but it is so annoying because why are you so happy? This, this is fucking awful. In her audition, she played it another way too. She played it very straight as if she was bored of her job and gave a very flat delivery. That would have been funny too, but I'm really glad they went with a more happy tone. At that age, you can truly snap at the drop of a hat because of all those hormones just broiling inside of you. The way I felt so seen by Ginger just just sitting there seething while this upbeat nurse is just so upbeat telling her, yep, so every month chunks of your uterus are gonna fall out of your vagina. Oh really? And what if I killed somebody about that? Hmm? What then? Men just get to live their lives while I have to experience an organ shedding a layer once a month? <laughs> oh, all of that subtext is not really subtext. That's the most overt theme about the movie. But much more than that, Ginger's story is very Shakespearean with how self destructive she is, and I don't feel like this is talked about enough. This is the really deep, dark part of the themes that you might want to brace yourself for. You need basically every trigger warning in the book to just watch the movie, so hopefully you're prepared for such a discussion, but if not, here is a timestamp. I'm going to be talking about themes concerning unaliving oneself, so feel free to skip ahead. Recently, I think that there's definitely been a shift in the collective consciousness of women who are finally starting to open up and talk about feeling 
suicidal during different points of their cycle. The ending of Ginger Snaps ties that all together for me in such an impactful way. Like, the ending of this movie was such a gut punch to me the last time I watched it. The poetry of Bridget having two tools in her hand, one to cure her sister and the other to put her out of her misery and the choice she makes. Despite the pact, Bridget's character development throughout the movie has led her here to choose life while Ginger has chosen death. And then we are reminded of the beginning of the movie when we see the collage of their art projects where what seemed like a morbid but frivolous hobby was just the surface level of the pain Ginger was really feeling. Almost reframing the beginning of the movie as a cry for help. I think that that's why Bridget and her mom share such an emotional scene together because she's like, no, I have failed as a parent. That also seems to reframe her cheeriness as maybe some type of avoidance to what her daughters were really going through. That's why all the cheeriness with the mom and the nurse is such bullshit because if we're not honest about this stuff and if we don't talk about it openly, it's gonna suffocate us. That type of repression leads to people eventually acting out, much like how Ginger's story went. Women need support. Women are dying in these systems that are largely created by men and were ignored. Do you know how little research has gone into the menstrual cycle? There's a new wave, like I said, of people sort of in this self-discovery phase about it. People are trying something called cycle syncing, where they tailor things down to their exercise and even what they eat on certain days to tailor the current hormone levels in their body. In Japan, women actually have a completely different work schedule to suit their hormonal needs. They actually get menstrual leave. Again, Emily Perkins, Miss Women's Study major, she said it best. It was not hard for me at all to relate to Bridget. I, when I was a teenager, I constantly thought that, you know, there was something wrong with my body. Like, I always felt like it was in excess in some places and deficient in other places. And I also remember feeling like really powerless in my body and, and feeling very critical of the larger culture that I was part of and that I was expected to become an adult and, and be a participating member in. And I really felt that, that perhaps success in a culture that I felt was corrupt would then be, mean that I was corrupt, you know, so I really wanted to resist adulthood in a way that I think Bridget does as well. The fact that women dominate the screen in the horror genre, but there are still so few mainstream movies that really embody the feminine POV, it grinds my gears. What it means to be a woman is definitely exemplified in the, all the slashers of the past where women are slaughtered with their boobs hanging out, sure. So rarely do we get a legitimate female Male perspective. It's funny though because Catherine Isabel, because she was so young, she did not understand the script's impact at the time. It didn't really strike me as is odd or different. Again, I was like 17. I had not watched every horror werewolf menstruation puberty movie that did exist at all. So I wasn't really aware of how different or special that was really. And I mean, there's a lot of horror stuff. We, I just look at it and go like, there's no, there's nothing really redeeming for me as a woman in horror in this. It is just, you know, victim number, whatever type thing. So I think we're getting better at that. I think, you know, in the past, uh, there's been great female characters in horror and, you know, not so great female characters in horror, but female characters in general are getting better these days, not just in horror. So I think across the board, we're, we're leveling up. I'm saying scripts like Ginger Snaps should not be considered special. 24 years later and this movie is still kind of a diamond in the rough. Don't worry, I am aware of Julia Ducorno, I am aware of Rose Glass and other indie filmmakers coming up in the industry, but why is it taking this long and why are women not seeing the same type of funding for their own stories. A man made ginger snaps. Like, <laughs> I know why. It, that's rhetorical. I just want you to think about it. Even with all this movie embodied, how phenomenal it was, it still was such a chore to even get it released. You know, the thing about releasing it was interesting because, you know, I had, I the whole time believed that I had the next Harry Potter. I was like, this is, people are going to go crazy for this. They're going to love this. This is, this is so original. And, and of course, people didn't go for it at all. It kind of like just got, you know, the, our, our Canadian distributor put it out at the beginning of May and then it was like trounced by the mummy returns like the next weekend and gone. And that was the end of it. That was the end of my little dream. It was over. 
And in the and in the United States, straight to video. Yeah, it only made about half a million dollars in Canadian theaters, and then about two years later, John Fawcett got a call that there was an article about it in the New York Times. About a week after that, HBO bought the movie, and then they were playing it all the time on their channel. What's odd to me is that at the time, despite the really low theatrical yield, critics revered it. That's pretty unusual for a cult classic horror movie. Typically, critics don't really understand them. See the thing, The Shining, and American Werewolf in London even? Every single Rotten Tomatoes review from 2001 at the time of the release gave it a fresh score. It deserves a cult following among satire-loving, feminist-minded, gore aficionados who appreciate a well-made human tale. It's altogether devilishly cunning. It actually kind of makes me want to die, though, that Peter Howell's review is like, this is a superbly realized take on the perils of being different in a world that demands conformity. The whole time being different is just being a woman. Like, get me out of here. He's not wrong to be clear. It's That's just depressing. The movie sits at a 90% critic score and a 78% audience score, which is surprising. It's usually the other way around. Even though it didn't have an initial boom, it was an instant cult classic, which is why it ended up becoming a trilogy. Uh, my initial thing was, I don't really know that I have a story for this, but then they were like, here, take our money. And so I said, great. The first sequel following Bridget trying to navigate the world without her sister during her own transition did not do well. It was a complete theatrical flop and so they released the third movie directly to video. The third movie is very strange, a very interesting pivot where they basically make the exact same movie but they set it 200 years in the past. All three movies did relatively well critically. Most general audience members do agree that the sequels do kind of fall off in quality. Personally, I like the third movie more than the second one because to me, the magic is in the relationship of the girls, but neither the second or the third movie even hold a candlestick, don't even come close to the first movie. I couldn't find information about DVD sales for the third movie, so I'm not really sure about monetary success. But while never a commercial success, the original Ginger Snaps definitely lives on as a feminist landmark in cinematic history. I think the most obvious sign of its legacy is the movies that imitated its formula with a similar thematic sentiment. Jennifer's Body is the biggest one that comes to mind. The parallels there are too many to name. That's a movie that I'll be covering hopefully in March for Women's History Month. I'm so excited to dive into the career of Karen Kusama, oh my god. And though not super thematically related, I would say that the pregnancy horror of Titan must have been loosely inspired by the body horror of Ginger Snaps. Just, you know, womanhood, womanhood and horror. There's been a huge wave of pregnancy horror in the last decade and honestly I feel like a lot of that does pay homage to Ginger Snaps. The idea of transformation and the body going through this process, you know, that I think they're very closely related. But Jennifer's Body, most of all, you have that deep dive to look forward to if you're subscribed. And if you're not subscribed already, then what are you doing? Stick around. With that, I'm going to bring this deep dive to a close. There's so much more that I could get into, especially concerning the themes of this movie, but that could be a whole other video on its own. Hopefully you enjoyed learning about the story of Ginger Snaps. I definitely had a blast doing all this research because like I said, I think it is the best werewolf movie ever made. Maybe the special effects weren't quite as good as an American Werewolf in London, but to me it still is the gold standard as far as feminist horror cinema goes, so that's that on that. We can keep that debate up in the comments. Feel free to leave any questions, comments, concerns down below. If you want even more content from me, then check out my second channel. That's where I talk about physical media. It's where I vlog my spooky outings. I also post weekly to my Patreon, so you can sign up for that. That is linked down below. More than anything, I just hope that you enjoyed this deep dive, and I hope I catch you in the next one. Bye!